Good morning. God bless you. Let us pray. In Jesus' name. Father, Lord, we exalt and honor you. We thank you because of your name that is highly lifted up. We thank you because you are the ancient of days, the omnipotent and the omniscient God, the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come. Lord, we use this video to exalt and to honor you for the privilege you've given to us once again to gather in your name. Because in your presence, we are content. In your presence, we can bring love offering. For the Lord, we can bring songs of thanksgiving in your presence. We exalt and honor you tonight because this is another day of the day. A day we should rejoice, a day we should be glad. A day we should celebrate the risen Lord. Today is the first day of the week. The day we the saints gather together in commemoration for the resurrection of Christ and to exalt him and to give glory to the King who has risen, who has given us hope, who has promised us his coming again. Because we saw him went up, and we know in like manner we will see him return. Lord God of hosts, write your word in our hearts. By the help of your Holy Spirit, interpret it to us, that we may be better steward of your word. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Brethren, tonight, you are welcome again to our weekly study on understanding prophecy. Today, we are looking at the final letters to the churches, the church of Laodicea, letter to the church of Laodicea, and that is the final message for today, letter to the church of Laodicea. Ladosha was one of the most flourishing church in the Asia Manor of Turkey. And this church called Ladosha, they were rich in cathedral and they were eminent in precious stone. And Christ's decision to pick this particular church as a letter to this new age church, which I will call today church. Is astonishing. That tells us that Christ actually knows everything. He knows our work. He knows the thing we do in secret. He knows the hidden thoughts in our mind. Because the church of Lagosha is not just a small church in Asia Minor of talking. The church of Lagosha was a church that was rich in precious stones. They were rich in gold, they were rich in silver. In fact, they were a rich city, the Ladosha. But today, how does it contrast our today church? Since the church age, there is no age of the church that is as rich as this generation. Today we have single man can single-handedly erase a cathedral of about 220, 500,000, even 1 million city cathedral. All in the name of God. We have beautiful churches, beautiful pulpits, ties, we have ministers riding on private jets, which is wonderful in the name of God. But there is never a generation like ours that has been backward in sharing the gospel. We are believers believe that the pastor or the man on the altar is equipped enough to help them to share the gospel so they don't have to do anything. And the man of the altar is busy building cathedral without caring less for the mission to the rich nations of the earth. And that is the reason why today lesson is key to believers. First we read, because our text today is taken from the book of Revelation chapter 3 from verse 14, which says, Unto the angels of the church of Ladosha writes, This thing says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This thing says who? The Amen. Why does God present himself in this entitlement as the Amen? As the ultimate solution in everything. 
the Amen. That God's word has the final say in every decision. Despite our medical advancement, despite our technological advancement, despite our internet advancement, despite our religious go and exploit, God still has the ultimate say. That's why he presented himself as the Amen. The faithful and the true witness. The God that is not going to change his status because your church has grown. The God that is not going to compromise because a member brought one million to the pastor as a tax or as a gift offering. The God that is not going to compromise based on standard of how rich or how poor you are or how well dressed or how poorly dressed you behave. That is the God you are serving. And that's why he told you he is the faithful and the true witness who does not change based on circumstances. Who is not going to say A today, tomorrow you say B and C. No, the God whose word is the offer and the omega, the beginning of all things. And he also presents himself as the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. All things came through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Because the Bible makes us clear that in him was light. And that light was the light of man. Verse 15 makes us clearer of what today church represents. I know your work. No matter how hidden you think your practice is, the Bible says you cannot hide it from God. Though you may cover your sin that no man can see, you cannot just hide it from God. Your rich dresses and your gorgeously beautiful clothes or cathedral is not going to cover your sin. God is making it clear to you. He knows your work. He knows your hidden thoughts. He knows what you do in secret. He knows what you do when you are alone in your secret bedroom. He knows what you do in the basement of your church. He you knows what you do in the pastor office when no member or secretary is there. He you knows how you handle your counseling session. He you knows how useful you take your morning prayers and your morning devotion. God knows how many times a day you study the scripture. He you knows how many people in your church out of one million are actually fasting and praying for the church. He you knows how many people actually took their Bible on a personal evangelism. He you knew how vicious is your home fellowship. He knew how you treat the wet, the, how you treat the poor, how you treat the widow and the orphan in your church. He you knows what you do with God's money that comes into the church every Sunday. God knows your work. He has an audit book waiting for you that will be read to you at the end of days. And that's why you must be careful to understand that you have an oversight. You may be the sole oversight in your church, but there is a God that has a higher oversight over the entire congregation. And he is saying to you today, I know your work. That you claim to be a gracious church. You claim to be a rich and a prospering church. But you are neither cold nor hot. Because you are not for the world, you are not for God. So we don't know what you belong to. And because you are lukewarm, the Lord says, you are neither cold nor hot. Because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will throw you out of my mouth. That means I cannot preserve you as a body of Christ. That means you are not qualified to be one of mine. That means you will be spot out from Christ's people. And that is what God is saying to the churches today of Ladosha and to millions of churches who belong to the New Age Church. A church where sins are tolerated, where evils and Christians live alike, where righteousness and sins they have the same name. God is saying today, but because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will throw you out of my mouth. I will spoil you out of my presence. You will not be qualified to live in the presence of God. The letter to the church of Ladosha, the implication is that in this church, men's opinion are exalted above God's opinion, resulting in people lukewarm to him. They honor men more than they honor God. Today, in many churches, if you ask the member, how was the service today? Oh, that pastor was wonderful. What message did you receive? Oh, the pastor was wonderful. 
Is the pastor wonderful the message that will take you to heaven? But God is asking you today, what did you study? What did you learn from your fancy, flamboyant, air-conditioned church? What message? How many souls did you save from the beginning of January to the end of last year? God is asking you that question. He's not asking you how many air conditions, how many cars you have in the church, how many people be blessed with a new car, a new marriage, a new house in the church. That is not God's program. God's program is asking you a simple question. How many souls were converted to me this year? How many people that made altar call in your church last year will be at the end of the year? God is asking you how many demons that were cast out in your church actually become a minister the following year? God is asking you those questions. Or do you simply just bring them in like leaves and grow the leaves and for devil to pick up at the end of the day or the best to swallow it up? God is asking you a question. There is nothing more offensive in any relationship than indifference. How many of us would be happy to give birth to a child? Five years, the child is still rolling on his stomach. Ten years, the child cannot even crawl. 20 years, the child refused to crawl. I bet you will be confused and you will hate that child. But God is saying to you, today, if you refuse to grow, I will throw you out of my mouth. Because this church is so offensive to the Lord that they make him sick. You know, when you have fever, your mouth produce some kind of saliva that you cannot swallow, neither can you. Even keep in your mouth because it's lukewarm. You want to spit it out. And that is how the church has become in the mouth of the Lord. The mass, the today believer, actually give God fever and make him want to vomit because it breaks. They are neither cold, they are not hot, they are indifferent in his mouth. Because if you get hot, you can still use hot water for tea. But if you get cold, we can still use cold water for drink, but now you are not either of them. You cannot be used for tea. You cannot be swallowed as cold water. So what are you? And that means God will spit you out of his mouth. Yet the greatest promise was given to any church of this age. Given to those who overcome in this particular church where people are looking, where people are indifferent. God promises us a great promise if we can overcome it. We have plenty in the biblical prophecies to warn us that this is no time to be lukewarm about God. If we are awake and pursue of God, we will be daily drives of our life. When men's opinions are exalted above the Lord, we take on an unsanctified sympathy for the way of men and being to fear their opinion more than God's opinion. In our time, this is called political correctness. Oh, we are introducing political correctness in churches. Where you cannot correct a sister who dread provocatively to sexually harass a brother in church because you don't want to offend anybody. But thus says the Lord that if eating food will make your brother to fall, it is rather you do not eat. If drinking of water will make somebody else to go to hell, it's better you do not drink water. Oh, some people will ask, what I did is it a sin? God is not telling you that your conduct is a sin, but He is telling you if your but what your body allows is leading other people to hell, you better stop it. Such a mindset will lead to a terrible fall. As the Lord warned Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Let us read Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Let's see what the Lord warned Peter about in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Matthew 16, 23. Matthew 16, verse 23, I read. Matthew 16, 23 says, But he turned and said unto Peter, Give thee, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou suffers not the things that be of the Lord, but those things 
those that be of men. Why did God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the same man who said, feed my lamb, the same man who said, feed my sheep, he just called him Satan. Get him behind me, Satan. Because why? He discovered he loved the world, not the things of God. He focused on the fleshly sympathy, things that pertain to the flesh, not the things that glorify the Spirit of God. And God, but he turned to Peter and said, Get me behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's interest. We will become a stumbling block to the purpose of God. If we become too sympathetic with the interest of men, how to live glorious in this world, we forgot about heavenly things. We seek only after earthly things. The Bible says if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit mortify the deed of the flesh, you shall live. And we will become a stumbling block to God's purpose. If our interests are only that of the earth. And this is why Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. If I were still seeking to please men, I would not be a born servant of Christ. If you are seeking to please men, oh, so that man will not be angry, so that men will say, I am making it, so that men will say, I am okay, so that men will not say to you, you don't belong to our class. They will not see your ministry as a ministry that is failing. Oh, how many people do you have in your church? Do you really know if you have 10 missionaries in 10 locations and each of them have 10, 10, you have more than 100 members in your church? You are far better than person that have 200 members in one location. We don't go for evangelism. And the Lord is saying to you, if you have 10 missionaries, you have more than Hundred members because each of those missionaries can at least save ten in six months and not only save them, make them another teacher in six months. It is better to have ten teachers than to have one thousand members. And I tell you, God is more interested in that ten teachers you have than having ten one hundred members in your church. If I were still seeking to please men, I will not be a bond servant of Christ. Nothing can cause us to be compromised to our service to the Lord as much as the fear of man. A lot of Christians today, because of the fear of man, they have put their hand into diversity. Things that are not pleasing to God. Some have even through gift corrupted the heart. Or the tendency to please men. Jesus warned the Pharisees about Luke chapter 16, verse 15, saying, You are those who justly yourself in this justify yourself in the sight of men, but God knows your heart. Oh, I don't want people to say I am this. How will I preach to the heart? What are you they not see me a popular pastor? In a hotel preaching to the harlot, they will misunderstand what I went there to do, and they will think I went there to consult a harlot because your heart is polluted. Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is it. And if your heart is not polluted, when they see you, professor, let them accuse whatever they can. But the Lord says, You please God, because God who sees the heart, He will. The Bible said. You should not be men pleaser. Christians who are men pleasers, they die before their time. Because nothing you do on earth can please men. Learn to understand. You who try to justify yourself in the sight of men, but God knows your heart. Always realize that. Whenever you are trying to justify yourself before your fellow evangelist, before your fellow minister, before the press school, who are gathering around you to get information out of you, be careful. Always know that God knows what is in your heart. God will bring everything into judgment. The things you have done is secret. The things that are hidden in the tablet of your soul, God will bring all into judgment. 
Jesus warned the Pharisees about this, that God knows their hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The things that you think that men will please, oh, that look at that church is very beautiful. Look at, oh, look at how the chorister is sing beautifully. Even when 95.9% of the choristers are adulterous and fornicators. Oh, what a wonderful song coming out from their mouth. The Bible says when the ark of the covenant of the children of Israel went into the camp of the Philistine, behold, the Israelites shot it. And he left the ark. And he left around it. Better than any praise you can ever get from any church. But today, what happened? The Bible says it was an empty shot. Why? Because God was not in the camp. If your choristers sing like angels, what a beautiful song. And the Holy Spirit is not present because of sin. It's an empty voice. And if your prayers can remove the cloud of the church and it's not founded on the principles of Christ, it's an empty shout. If all your religious obligation move people so that all the members of your church are sleeping on the ground, and there is no Holy Spirit attached to it. The same people that fall and the same people that wake up is an empty prayer. And the Lord is saying to you that these are distasteful in the sight of God. If we do what is pleasing to men, we will do what is detestable in the sight of God. The reverse is true. If we do that which is pleasing in the sight of God, we will often do what is detestable in the sight of men. We have a choice. Either God or men. Either to please the world or to please God. Either to love this present world or I hate God or to love God and hate this present world. Men will detest what we are doing. So who do we want to be? Do we want to be men pleaser or God pleaser? That choice and that answer is left for you to answer. Jesus again warned in Luke chapter 6, verse 26. Warn to you who all speaks well of you. People will say good things concerning you. Say what a wonderful believer he is. Oh, look at him before he speaks, he turns out. He's a wonderful minister. He is this. They will speak good of you. <laughs> in the same way their father used to treat the first prophet. Remember Ahab. Ahab had 450 prophets that sang his praise. But no one could save him from death. 450 prophets who would tell him whatever he wants to hear. When he tells a lie, they will lie. When he tells them to speak the truth, they will speak the truth. But no one could save them from death. But there was one. One prophet of God, Micah. Micah said, If thou go to this battle and return, then you know that the Lord has not sent me. And I have gone to battle and never return. One man voice, one with God is majority. But if you are men with the devil, you are minority. This is the category we fall into if we are driven by the fear of men, seeking their approval over God, speak what is contrary to the actual message of God, making us false prophets. The challenge is taken to a new level in James 4, verse 4. You adulteresses and adulteress. Do you know what that? Know that the friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Today, because you want to get paid by the states, they told you to do all kind of funny things in your church, which you know yourself that this is against the will of God. You are ready to oblige because you don't want to lose state money. You don't want to lose government funds. You don't want to lose grant money. Oh, you know that an organization you are taking money for, that if Christ was on earth, he would never have sent money for such an organization. Yes, you stretch your hand and receive such money. To which God are you giving it to? If the devil give the house of God for you, who will worship them? Ask that the question for yourself. If the devil build the house of God, who do you expect will worship them? And if the devil help you to convert members to your church, who do you think they will bring? You are adulteresses and adulteresses. 
Do you know that a friendship with the world is who is an enemy with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. We are called to love. We are called to love. We are called to love God, not to love the world. Not to be the friend with it either. Friends have common interests and pursuits. So if your interest and the world interests and the interest of politicians are up, you are either a politician or a pastor politician. If your interest and the interest, interest of the government are up, you are either a governmental church. Check your interest. Compare yourself with the world. Check your team. Check your ministry. Compare it with the world and see whether there is different. If there is no difference between you and the world, you are the people Christ is speaking to in the church of Laodicea. That you are neither cold nor hot. You are local. And because you are local, because the government of the world cannot identify you as one of their agency, and not can the church of God identify you as one of their members. So what are you? Ask yourself the question. Are you actually a church? A building that Christ built? That it says upon this rock I will build my church and that the gate of hell will not prevail against it? Are you that church? Or you are actually a guardian? A social guardian like a club or disco hall? Where anybody can dress the way they like and dance the way they like and eat the way they like and spend money the way they like? God is asking you to question. Does thieves steal and see your place as a safe refuge where they can hide their money? We are called to love the world, not to be a friend with it. Friends have something common, interests and pursuit. Our very lives are called to be prophetic, challenge the world's way. If we take on the ways of the world, we become enemy of God. And Jesus gave another important rebuke to those who would live in the fear of men. How can you believe when you seek glory from one another? Oh, our daddy Gio, mommy Gio. What? I remember what the Holy Spirit told me the first day he called me. I heard you want to be the general of Asha. I said I never thought of it. He said never. I bet you don't even dream of it. Don't think of it. Because it's not wrong to be general of Asha. But God is saying to you, take the oversight, not overshare. Take the oversight. Be a servant in my house, not a leader. Don't be a head over the house of Christ. We have one leader, which is Christ. We are all his servants. I like to build a ministry where we all labor and Christ take the glory. Not a ministry where I take the glory and Christ labor on behalf of the church. Do you you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only true God. The Greek word translated glory here would be translated as recognition. Recognition. You want to be recognized. You want wherever you go, people will know your name. But did heaven actually know your name? Did God say Will I hide from Abraham the things I have decided to do in Sodom? Since he will inherit all things. Abraham did not ask God what God was going to Sodom to do. But God reached out, he repented him. Abraham is going to inherit all things. What if he asks me tomorrow what happened in Sodom? Will I hide it from him? Will you be in that place of relationship with God? Where God cannot do anything good or evil and hide it from you. God cannot do anything on earth without coming to you first day by next year. I remember last year, 2022, I told my family that, look, this year is going to be an exceedingly terrible year. That God says things are going to be very difficult this year. But whenever things are difficult on our part, we should look up to the hills where our head comes from. And indeed, 
a week after I said that, coronavirus broke out and there was war in Ukraine. The commerce of the world turned upside down. Because God will not hide a secret from his servant, those things he has proposed in his heart to do. Whether it is good or evil. But this year he came to me again and said this is a year of freedom for the saints and punishment for the unjust. We are seeing in general, we are already seeing the punishment for the unjust. You can already see it in the sight of the American man who think that lying to become the president can be a very useful tool. It's already happening. So, seeking glory or recognition from men who destroy your faith. This is like the main reason why there is so little faith and power in the church today. This is the church age when most we fail to the deplorable condition, yet there is hope and a promise given to those who overcome the spirit of this age that is greater than the promise given to any church. Now let's go back to our Bible reading in the book of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, I read from verse 17. It says, Because thou sayest, I am rich. That has always been the problem of man. Man will look at God who laid the foundation of the universe. Who heaven is his throne. The whole earth that you and I step upon at the place he put his foot, his foot stone. And they will say to God, Do you know I'm a rich man? If you are rich, what would the man that's laid the foundation of the earth to say? If you are wealthy, what about the man that stretched line upon the universe? If you are rich in metal, what about the man whose throne is made of gold and precious stone? And the streets where he walks are made of garment. How rich can you actually be? Solomon only received a blessing from the Lord. The richest president in today's world is not as rich as Solomon. That was just because he received a blessing from God. With all the richest men we call on earth today, they are not as rich as Solomon. And that was the man who received a fragment of the blessing of the Lord. And God does not see Solomon rich in his sight. And let's learn to understand God's type of riches. God riches, the Bible says, the blessing of the Lord make it rich and it add no sorrow to it. There are no sorrow attached to his riches. But this church, they told God, you know we are very rich church. You don't expect us to behave like those poor church. They are suffering persecution because people can easily take them to police station. They don't have personal lawyer. They don't have defense lawyer that will stand and represent the church. That's why people trample upon them. But we know our standards. We are a rich church. Anybody talk to us anyhow, we act with judicially. We have real estates. We, are, we have three senators. We have governors. We have this. But God is saying to you one question. You say you are rich. You increase the goods. That is wonderful. You have built many cathedrals. That is wonderful. And have means of nothing in this world. When you call for private jets, they are at your backyard. God is saying you have need of nothing. To you, God is only the creator. Because the Bible says to the poor, God is his everything. But to the rich man, God is only the creator. And that is what God is to you. Because you don't need God for healing. Because you can easily go to the best insurance and the best doctor in the world. So why would you need God for healing? You don't need God for anything. You only need him as a creator. And no, nothing. Knowest not that thou art wretched. You are the most wretched of all men. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And God is counseling you today to listen to this word. Counseling you to buy of gold. <laughs> to buy. I counsel you to buy of me. I am the only one that is selling that gold that you can actually be rich through. All the world gives you are vanities. 
There are things taken from the nature of God. If you want the true riches, come to me. Buy my gold that are pure fire. Buy my gold that are tried in the fire. And what are these gold? The word of God. The Bible says, This book of the Lord should not depart out of the mouth. For it means thou shalt make thy way prosperous and thou shalt have good success. That is pure good. But it is destroyed with fire. Because when you are rich, you will know how you get there. And because you know how you get there, the devil cannot pull you down. And that is the good that is tried in fire. And that is where patience comes. And when patience finishes work in you, it makes you perfect. And this is the only way that can make you perfect. That you may actually be rich. And I have counseled you also. Because of your nakedness. Even when you think you are clothed with houses, you are clothed with garments, you are clothed with cars, you are clothed with beauty. But I'm saying to you today, come to me and buy white rabbits so that you will not walk in nakedness. When I come, I will not find you naked. The Bible says to him that overcome will walk with me in white. And God is telling you today that white rabbits, they are still unsaved. A time will come that they will no longer be on sale. Now is the time for you to go and buy your own. Go to the market to get the self salvation. Buy white ramets and put it on so that you will not walk naked. And God is saying to you so that you will be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not show to the whole world. Because today you might think you are rich, you have need of nothing. God is saying, Buy white ramets from me. So that you can be clotted. So that the shame of your nakedness will not appear before God. And I have also counseled you because you say we see. Yeah. And no wonder Jesus said to the Pharisees, when they asked him, are we also blind? He said, if you were blind, you would not have seen. But now you claim you see, your sin will remain with you. And God is saying to you today, come to me and anoint your eyes with eye slides so that you may see you will see the truth and you will know the truth. And the Bible says you shall see and know the truth and the truth will set you free. So it is only the truth you know that will set you free. But today, if you claim you see, the Bible says pray that you may be blind so that you can actually see. Because if you be blind, you will not even convince him. But now that you claim that you see, Oh my God, I'm sorry for you because you're saying amen. And the Lord says, as many that I love, God is saying to you, despite your deprivation, despite your sin, I love you. And because he loves you, and that is the reason why he rebuke and chasten you, because he doesn't want you to perish, because no matter how hard which word are, they are not intended to make anyone down. They are not intended to judge anyone. They are intended to bring you up to speed, to prepare you for the great days of the Lord, to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that's why God is chastening and rebuking you, so that you can be zealous and repent. To repent, because repentance is the gift that qualifies a man for salvation. Why God is doing this so that He will bring the fruits meant for repentance. Don't think you are rich. Don't think you have need of nothing. But you must know that you are poor, wretched, naked, and blind. God is calling you to come. If you realize your nakedness, if you realize your blindness, if you realize your nakedness and your poverty, come to the Lord today. He said, come unto me, all ye that have labored. And heavenly love, I will give you rest. And he said you should learn from him. His yoke is easy. His body is very light. The Lord is counseling you to come to him today. So that you might learn from him. Because he has promised rest for those that come to him. And now he's saying to you, I am not only calling you. I am even at the door of your heart to mount. The Lord is at the door of every heart and is knocking. 
and he's saying, if any of you will just hear that voice, whispering senses into your ear, telling you this is not the way I chose for you, this is not the path I prefer for my servant, this is not the way I want my church to be like. If you will listen to that voice today, the Lord said, I will come in into you and I will suck with you and you with me forever. Remember, if you overcome, the Lord will grant you a free seat to sit with him in his throne. He will not say because you are gentile or you are not qualified, you are not from the Hebrew store, but if you overcome, you will have opportunity to sit with Christ on his throne. Remember what he said, we are seated in Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and power, far above the rulers of the dark forces of this world, far above spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So if you overcome, you will be granted a seat in the throne of Christ. Even as I, the Lord Jesus, overcome, I am seated with my Father in his throne. Jesus overcame and is seated in the throne of God. If you overcome this world, if you overcome the lust of the eye, the pride of men, the lust of the flesh, you will be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above all that torment you, far above all that sought to put you into captivity. And you will take captive those who captive you will. And the Lord said, finally, he that has an ear. And the question today, do you have ear? Or are you are one of those who does not have ear to hear? But I tell you, even if you are deaf, the Lord said, let it that is deaf not be cast out. Let it rather be healed. And I say to you, if you are deaf, may your ear be opened in Jesus' name to hear the word of God. And if you are blind, may your eyes be open to read and understand. And if you have no understanding, may your understanding be fruitful to receive what God has promised. And if you are lost or poor or in bondage or in darkness, thus says the Lord, He came that He might give freedom to those who are bound. Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon Him. And I proclaim liberty upon that captive daughter or captive sons of Zion right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Now hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. If you have ear to hear, if you have understanding to understand, comprehend what the Spirit is saying to the churches before it is too late. This message is given to save life now that you, the man of God, may be equipped in every good work so that you who are saved and overcome will have opportunity to sit with Christ on his throne when he shall come, judging all the twelve tribes of Israel. God bless you. This is the end of our today's message. Brethren, before we before we conclude today's message, I will want to exhort God and many of our brethren who have been listening to this message, understanding prophecy. From next week, Sunday by 5 p.m., we will be starting the wrath of God. And our first lesson on the wrath of God is the setting, the heavenly setting. Because after this message to the churches, when the church age is over, there was a call by the Lord Jesus Christ himself to come up here so that he can show us things that will happen after the churches. Because the thing that will happen after the church can only be viewed by the saints from Mezzan. It's only the unbeliever that will live through it. But the saints will view it from our heart. They will see it, but from our heart. And just as God is looking down upon the tribulation, so will we, the saints, look down upon the tribulation. Because he has promised us we will not experience his wrath. And that is exactly why next week is going to be very critical. We're going to try our best to exploit all viewpoints and to make it simple and well understood, not in theological terms, but in plain English, so that just the same way we explain the churches, so that the book of Revelation will no longer be a strange book to you. It will be an easy day-to-day -day sermon in your church, 
where you can use it to teach your member. Because this word are not given for pastors or for ministers or for those that study eschatology. But this word are given to save life now before it is too late. God bless you. My name is Missionary Collins Adore. I am the founder of Christian Global Foundation and I welcome you to join and listen to more message like this every week. Brethren, if you miss any of the letters to the churches, you can still see it easily by going to CGFMS login slash home slash video and you'll be able to see exactly what we have done so far. And if you are on Facebook, you can go to this link of Facebook slash CGF Global and you'll be able to come to our page or you can just type CGF Open House Fellowship on Facebook, it will take you to this page. You will not miss any parts. God bless you. By next year, we shall also be having an opportunity if you want to join our online Bible school and other training activities. God will help you as you participate. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is the end of our today's teaching. We hope to see you next week Sunday by 5 p.m. God bless you as you participate.